Good morning. Welcome to the Thurston County Board of County Commissioners Agenda Setting Work Session. It's Tuesday, June 8, 2021, 9.02 a.m. My name is Ty Mentor, Chair of the Board. To my left is Vice Chair Commissioner Gary Edwards, and to my right is Commissioner Carolina Mejia. Um, County Manager Miro Chavez is with us, as well as Clerk of the Board Amy Davis and our Public Information um, Officer Megan Porter. A whole host of folks uh, through Zoom that we'll get to. Uh, we have a lot of stuff lined up this morning. The public can attend along on our YouTube channel or through conference line at 360-252-9020, and the pin for that is 1234. We have, uh, let's see, we're going to start with the COVID-19 update, homeless <coughs> strategies, uh, jump to a, um, to a pending hearing uh, or an item from last week, and then we will go with item four into this afternoon's draft agenda. So we'll start with COVID-19 update, go to county manager. And the reason that you have that uh, briefing and public hearing decision pending, uh, item number three, uh, the county auditor would like to participate in that conversation and she had a conflict later on. So that's the reason you have that on item number Perfect. three. Okay, and let's go to um, Shelly Slaughter, Director of Public Health and Social Services. Good morning, Shelly. Good morning, commissioners. Today is day 489 of Thurston County's COVID emergency response. To date in Washington State, there have been 440,920 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Washington residents, with 5,856 people that have lost their lives. This includes in Thurston County, 10,516 confirmed cases of COVID-19 since the pandemic began and 109 Thurston County residents that have lost their lives, including one in the last week. In the last week, in terms of cases, we've had 159 new confirmed cases in the last seven days. 100 and, <clears throat> excuse me, 671 Thurston County residents have been hospitalized to date with nine new hospitalizations occurring in the last week. 89.5% of our regional acute beds are currently occupied in, in regional hospitals, with 10.5% of those beds occupied by COVID patients and 18.9 COVID patients uh, in regional ICUs. Our test positivity rate has continued to decline. It is currently at 4.4%. We continue to have testing available for anyone in the community that may have been exposed to COVID-19 or is experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and would like to be tested. Today, our team will be at Rochester Organization of Families, ROOF, um, from 10 to 1 uh, in Lacey tomorrow, at Union Gospel Mission on Thursday and Friday at Evergreen State College. Our outbreak team uh, has investigated 60 congregate care outbreaks to date and six that they are currently working on. In terms of vaccines, uh, good news on that front, 263,068 doses have been administered here in Thurston County. 47.4% of our total population, including children, uh, have initiated a COVID-19 vaccine and 41.66% of our total population is fully vaccinated. A metric that we're looking at is 16 and over. Uh, we are aiming to reach the governor and the president's goal of getting 70% of 16 and older having initiated at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine by June 30th. We are currently at 58.78% of 16 and older that have initiated COVID-19 vaccines. And 51.61% of 16 and over who are now fully vaccinated and have completed their series. So we are making some good progress. Um, again, we have shifted our, our gears um, in terms of mass vaccination efforts. We will be wrapping up our mass vaccine site at South Puget Sound Community College at the end of this month and have increased our community-based mobile vaccine uh, throughout the county. Uh, today, 
we will be at Capitol Mall from 1 to 5 p.m. And we are now at Capitol Mall seven days a week out in the parking lot outside of Sephora. We will be at South Puget Sound Community College from 5 to 8 p.m. this evening offering the Janssen vaccine and also at Planet Fitness uh, in Olympia uh, from 5 to 8 p.m. this evening. Tomorrow we will be at Ridgeline Middle School in Yelm from 8 to 1 administering Pfizer doses uh, again at the mall each day and then from 5 to 8 p.m. Moderna at South Puget Sound Community mm -hmm. College. We have many clinics and vaccine availability, all three types, and people interested in finding out where they can get vaccinated can visit Vaccine Locator and also our Thurston County Public Health and Social Services website. Our vaccine allocation uh, model has also shifted at the state level. We are now at an on-demand vaccine ordering. Since there is vaccine available, uh, we can order what we need um, at this time. Uh, so vaccines are allocated to providers based upon a need and anticipated demand rather than the former allocation model uh, that was a per capita population uh, metric only. Um, I also wanted to share uh, some great uh, and exciting news and well-deserved congratulations. Uh, Thurston County's own Bruce Rohrbach, who uh, has been working as our operations section chief on our COVID-19 IMT, um, as well as on our vaccines, uh, is being recognized um, as a uh, hometown hero uh, on a segment on Como News uh, this week on June 10th uh, on a, a news segment called Seattle Refined. And Bruce is receiving a special reward for being a uh, a superhero in our community for all his efforts. And so we're very proud of Bruce um, and hope that people will tune in uh, to see that uh, special special news, news program and award that Bruce is receiving. And with that, I'll answer any questions that you may have. That's pretty great. Uh, congratulations to Bruce on, on that award. Um, I uh, just came from vacation and at one of the um, restaurants we went to, uh, one of the restaurants were offering vaccination in the back. And I thought that was pretty cool for people who were just coming to eat and they had that availability. And I was wondering how we reached out to maybe restaurant owners here and asked um, if they would be interested in maybe hosting a, a vaccination site uh, at their establishment. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Mejia. That is a great idea. We are looking at lots of different uh, creative ways that we can offer vaccine to people throughout our community. Um, we have been offering vaccines to uh, local restaurant workers at the end of our clinics um, and have traveled to local restaurants to, to offer that. We're also working with the Thurston County Chamber and Thurston Strong uh, to uh, promote mobile clinics to local businesses. Um, so this week, I mentioned today, we're focusing on um, fitness facilities. So that's why we're at Planet Fitness. Uh, but we have many other businesses that we plan on reaching out and hosting mobile events too. So, and that does include uh, places like places like restaurants. That's great. Thank you. The Mariners, uh, was it the Mariners Wednesday night and they were vaccinating folks right there at Edgar's Cantina in left field. So catch a ball game, get vaccinated. <laughs> you, I want to make sure I've got these numbers right. You said uh, we've got 263,000 vaccinations that we've given out. And uh, our population is about 300,000. Much over that or much under that. And that, that just doesn't square with the percentages that we're talking about. I'm curious why. Are you uh, under the governor's goal? I thought even one, if you've had one vaccination towards that 70%. So 
what's the discrepancy there? And I don't think we're doing VA or military. Uh, you know, I don't know if we have those counts. The uh, 263,068 is the number of doses administered in Thurston County. So that includes single dose vaccine, Janssen, as well as multi uh, dose vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna. So that's the total number of doses. So that won't correlate with the number of people in Thurston County. Um, but in terms of reaching that uh, goal that I mentioned, uh, we are at 58.78% of 16 and older of our Thurston County population that has had at least one dose so far. What we're trying to get to is 70% of people that will have had one dose um, by the time that we get to July. Okay, so the 263 could be single shot Johnson & Johnson and then it counts twice if you get two Madrona shots. Or, yes. Is that right? Okay. Okay. okay, just wondering about that discrepancy. Uh, last week I asked about the difference between natural immunity versus a, a uh, serum, developed serum. And as far as I know, we don't know how long the developed serum lasts and gives you protection in your body. And we don't know how long natural immunity lasts and gives you protection in your body. Uh, so, but I still don't understand. Can you give me a Reader's Digest version of why I should convince people that have had the virus and recovered why they should go in and get a shot? I'm. Uh, a lot of folks like to think Mother Nature has it figured out pretty good. So have you come up with an answer on that yet? Thank you, Commissioner Edwards. I did confer with our health officer, Dr. Dimiana Abdemelik, who wasn't able to join us this morning to share this information. But the Center for Disease Control does recommend, as does Washington State's Department of Health, recommend that people who have recovered from COVID-19 um, confirmed disease, do get a COVID-19 vaccine shot. You are correct that we do not know yet how long immunity lasts for people that are vaccinated or how long immunity lasts for people that have uh, been ill uh, and have antibodies to COVID-19. We don't know that yet, but um, it is believed that the protection that you receive from a vaccine may confer greater immunity if you get if you have had COVID-19 and you also get the shot. Also, uh, with the recent development of COVID-19 variants um, throughout the world, um, to include um, in Thurston County, uh, the COVID-19 cases, or excuse me, um, COVID-19 COVID illness that people have had may not have been those variants. We know that the uh, we know that the vaccines have been proven to be effective around many of the variants as this virus continues to mutate, and that's one of the reasons at this point that uh, vaccinations are recommended for people that have had COVID nineteen. I guess uh, just as a follow up to that, as far as you know, then there are no study informations information available comparing say those that got the virus early on and maybe have recontacted the virus versus someone who got a shot and then contacted the virus we don't we don't have that information and and the bottom line i guess what i'm hearing from you is just trust us we're from the government, we're here to help and trust us. And that's, well, that's fine if that's the answer, but there's a lot of people out there that I can't sell that to. And that's why I'm, that's why I'm kind of being persistent about this as well. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Abdemelik is going to be covering this in more detail in her community letter that will be released later this week. 
Um, and there are many studies happening right now. I think that we don't have enough time, has not yet passed to be able to develop uh, conclusions from that. But CDC's recommendations um, are based on science and we encourage people to get their COVID-19 vaccine, even if they had COVID-19 infection. Okay, I mean, I can, I can just see though that if I was the parent of a, I don't know, 11 year old, uh, I'm not sure when we get to that point, or a 16 year old, or, or an adult, a young adult, I just, I would like to be able to have some assurance that there is a difference. That's so I could explain that to people. I just don't have enough money or uh, uh, information to explain that. Thank you. Thank you, Shelly. Thank you. We'll move on to uh, item two, homeless strategies update. Keely Marino is with us. Good morning, Keely. Good morning, commissioners. Keely Marino with Public Health and Social Services. I have a, just a really quick update for you today. It's just going to focus on our rental assistance um, progress. And first, I'll report on the Community Action Council. At this point, 437 Thurston County households have been served. There are 593 applications that are in process, so just in queue waiting for checks to be, to be signed and delivered. Um, and there are 621 appointments, so um, quite a number of individuals. They have paid out $2.7 million in past rent at this point and upwards of $63,000 in utility assistance. For the youth and young adult population, um, they have served 31 households. Um, in process, there are 54, so just waiting for that check to be signed and delivered again. Um, and there are 52 appointments for young people um, in queue. They have, they have uh, paid out $262,000 in past rent to those young people and their landlords and have paid um, about $1,000 in utility assistance at this point. So just continuing to move along. Um, and uh, every week, the numbers keep climbing pretty quickly. So that that's encouraging to me. And that's really all I have for, for you today. No questions. Thank you. Uh, no, sir. Me neither, Keely. Keep it short today. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, that brings us to our uh, item three, briefing public hearing decision pending. Capital Improvement Minor Amendment. I believe the Thurston County Auditor is yeah, involved. Uh, yeah. um, thank, you. thank you. Thank you for joining us this morning, Mary. Thank you for allowing me to, you want me to just say my piece? Yeah. Hold on now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let, me, um, let, me, let me frame the issue, if I may. Yeah, let, no. we know that, Mary, I know that you have, uh, I know that you have, listen to the meetings from last week that, that the board had, but uh, county manager kind of, Commissioner Mejia wasn't here, um, so let's have county manager kind of lay out where we, where we stand with this and then we can get your input. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, commissioners. Um, this is related to uh, a couple of improved minor amendments. Uh, as, as you may recall, uh, they were uh, submitted a couple of uh, minor, uh, two projects to be included on the capital facilities plan, and that is the, the purchase of the Madman property, as well as including the 3000 Pacific uh, uh, Avenue project. Um, through the process, the, I believe the planning commission uh, had a work session over a month ago, I can't remember the exact date, uh, as a follow-up to that, they held a public hearing uh, last um, uh, Wednesday, I believe. And uh, as a result of the public hearing, I believe they received uh, three uh, public testimonies. Um, and the result of that conversation, they submitted a recommendation uh, for the board that is included in your packet. Uh, we finally got the, uh, the um, no fine, we got the, uh, the actual written recommendation from the chair of the of the planning commission. You held a, a, a briefing related to this matter on Thursday, last Thursday, where you have uh, extensive discussion related to the uh, upcoming recommendations by the planning commission. 
the recommendations of the planning commission is included on the first page of their letter. And uh, the first one is not to move forward with adding the atrium project at 3000 Pacific Avenue to the 2021-2026 capital improvement program. And the second recommendation was to delay the decision on the Madman Complex project until a follow-up work session can be held. On the back of that, on the back of that uh, letter is included a little bit of uh, an addendum, which uh, outlines uh, additional mm -hmm. information. I hope you had the opportunity to review that. So uh, the reason as to why this matter is before you today, we would like for you to uh, 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 give direction in terms of uh, the, the options the board has is to accept the recommendations of the Planning Commission. If that is the case, that, uh, if, if the board accepts the, the, board of, uh, the recommendations of the Planning Commission, the item this afternoon for you to consider setting a public hearing will not be needed. Also, the board has the option to modify the recommendations of the Planning Commission, however you think is appropriate. And the third option that you have is not to accept the recommendations of the Planning Commission. So an, uh, in options number one and two, depending on how the board would like to vote, then the item this afternoon will have to move forward to set the public hearing before you take a formal action. You're not, at this point, you're not amending the capital facilities plan. At this point, you're providing direction how you like to proceed so we can go with a public hearing that at this point is scheduled for uh, June 22nd. Uh, related uh, to the uh, amendment of the of the capital facilities plan. That is in terms of the process. Uh, I will stop there. Did I miss anything on the process, Jennifer? No, I think you covered it well. Thank you. So as a result of the conversation last week, um, last Thursday, uh, Commissioner um, Edwards asked uh, two questions and I have some information for you today. Uh, he uh, he was uh, Commissioner Air was actually asking, what if uh, the uh, Madman property changed hands? Are we going to be evicted right off the bat? And you know my words, uh, or we have options. So we consulted with our prosecuting attorney, and let me read some of uh, the excerpts of, of that. Uh, the, in, indeed, the current uh, uh, amendment. Amendment number one to the lease, and that's, that's what I believe Commissioner Edwards was reading on, on the appraisal of that property, ends on December 31st, 2024. Um, but also, I believe, what was the risk if, uh, if they change ownership and that uh, uh, lease is not renewed by December 31st, after December 31st, 2024? So uh, on the last, uh, on the amendment number one, paragraph two uh, is labeled as term. Let me read that out loud. The parties agreed to extend the lease for an additional four years and nine months and shall commence uh, on the first day of April 2020 and shall terminate on the last day of December 2024, as stated. If so desired, the county may extend the lease for additional years by providing written notice no later than September 30, 2024. Furthermore, if so desired, the lessee may terminate uh, the, uh, uh, the lease 36 months by providing written notice within 180 days. The, um, there was a, a, a couple of steps on, the, on, on this when the amendment was uh, um, signed. It was not notarized, as it should have been. That creates a little bit of a risk. And also, um, the, uh, assuming that, uh, that this is sold and the, and the, and the ownership changes, uh, the term of the existing lease uh, could be uh, asked by the new owner to be open, meaning by raised rents or by changing the lease terms. So that is uh, the, the, the risk, and I believe that is the, the question the commissioner was, uh, was asking, is uh, if the change ownership, there is some sort of a risk if the new owner would like to open the terms of the lease to see whether the lease uh, increased rents 
uh, or uh, just simply uh, uh, terminate the, the lease that we have. Before you go off that, what was the you said something about 36 months? Yeah, that's what it states in, in, in the uh, paragraph 2, in the last sentence. It says, furthermore, if so desired, the lessee may terminate the lease uh, after 36 months by providing written notice within 180 days, so 180 day notice. That's, that's, that's right, and that's us. Yeah, that's us. Yeah, that's us. Yeah, that's us, yeah. We're the leasee. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, in, in trying to address that question, um, uh, I believe there is uh, change ownerships um, could present a risk. Uh, it's not certain, but could present a risk that new owner could open up the terms of the lease. Uh, the other question the commissioner had was... Uh, could, uh, could we stick with that one just for a second, please? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Amendment 1. I thought we were talking... Uh, is Amendment 1 in here? Amendment 5 of the lease is what we were talking about the other day. But that was the continuation. Yeah, but you, you, you said Amendment 1. I'm just curious. Um, that's what I, I have. I don't know what... Okay, well, five. it seems like I'm... Maybe I've misplaced something. I don't know what, what document... Okay, I'm sure. good. That's the only question. Go ahead. Um, I do have a follow-up question. Is So we have to depend on... Legal, we never get a chance to have discussion with legal here. I mean, we don't have legal here. And that's one of my concerns. I, do we have legal on the screen that can verbalize in this fashion if we need to? I'm not saying we need to. Yeah. Elizabeth was with us. She's got a doctor's appointment. She may be okay. doing this here in a minute. Okay, good enough. That's fine. Thank you. Go ahead. So I'm just reading yeah. the attorneys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. not making this up. I know, I, well, I, don't, to be sure. I know you're not making it up, so but, I'm just, uh, to make sure. it's hard to have a discussion with a piece of paper. So. Yeah, so, I, I, so the, the, uh, the other question was whether this, uh, before a uh, purchase can occur, whether that specific project needs to be uh, included in the capital facilities plan. Because of the nature of the, of the funding source, which is read one, it is a requirement that needs to be included in the capital facilities plan before we issue a check. And that is the purpose as to why we included the Madman property as part of the amendment into the capital facilities plan. I expanded the question whether um, if, the, if, uh, if the purchase can be uh, used other funds, including the general fund, aside from the REIT. So, um, this response to that additional question, the general fund and other common funds do not have substantive requirements for a specific project to be included in the CFP. However, there is a procedural, procedural requirement under GMA that applies to capital expenditures regardless of the type of source. So in a way, it implies that even if, if, uh, if, if uh, we use general fund, it should be included on the capital facilities plan. Further, uh, he says, however, this is my, however, is the, the GMA requirements likely allow for special or unusual circumstances under in which uh, a county could make an expenditure on a project, in this case, the purchase of money, which is, uh, that is no part of the existing CAP or CIP. It may be, for example, a change of circumstances that could require capital expenditure on a project that has not, that was not foreseen at the time in which the capital uh, improvement project was approved in December. And that, to me, that probably meets the category. So I was trying to explore that. Um, certainly, uh, before the, uh, the read one uh, funding can be expanded purchasing this property, uh, uh, it has to be included in the capital facilities plan. And that is the reason why we include it as part of the minor amendment. I, just, I would, <clears throat> if I may clarify on that as well, um, we do have an item currently in the CIP that is land acquisition. Uh, the Generate. reason that we included the Motman purchase on uh, the uh, CIP would be for transparency and to allow us to begin uh, building modifications as soon as we have the space when other tenants move out. 
um, but we could purchase the building under the current CIP with no change under the land acquisition heading. Uh, thank you. And the last item that I'd like to highlight as part of my uh, 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 the framing of this particular um, decision point is uh, last Friday, Commissioner Edwards attended a presentation at the uh, Regional Planning Council. Um, and I put over an email to the other two commissions, encouraging them to watch that presentation. But I did include this presentation in your packet, so it's included in your packet. Uh, you, you didn't have the chance to uh, review that. So that was the request from uh, Commissioner Edwards. So, and I'll stop there. And, uh, and, uh, and I'm sure, uh, uh, I think, uh, County Auditor Mary Hall is here, you know, to provide a perspective, but Let's have, uh, let's hear from the auditor and then we can, go ahead, Mary. Thank you, commissioners, for allowing me to attend your meeting. <clears throat> I did take the opportunity to watch the planning commission meeting um, that was happened last week and also the your Thursday morning meeting. And I have to tell you, I was really surprised that the Mottman uh, complex was not in the CIP. I mean, we've been discussing this since January. This is not new. And I thought it was just going to be a formality. Um, but I have to be honest, I didn't feel that the county's best interest was um, was being taken into consideration at that planning commission meeting. And I really want to apologize to Robin and Jennifer and thank you so much for representing the auditor's office interest, um, you know, with the planning commission last week. I wish I could have been there. Um, you know, it didn't look like it was a very fun or productive meeting, to be honest. And and I know that commissioners and commissioner staff have been working overtime to take care of our needs, not just this year, but last year. And I really appreciate that. And I know it isn't easy for members of advisory boards to always be prepared or ready for meetings, but the job of government is hard and it requires a lot of time, but that should not stop the county commissioners from doing your job. I mean, who could have predicted the death of this owner? This landlord was always really good to us and, and provided just about every tenant improvement we asked for. The only one he didn't was one that we wanted bollard so people couldn't drive up to the building, but he didn't want to modify the concrete. That was the only time he said no. Um, but he died of COVID and we have no idea what's going to happen to this property now. And I did do my due diligence. I worked with the assessors, uh, commercial real estate staff, their, their appraisers, and they pulled all the buildings in Thurston County that had the size and the amount of parking that we would need for this type of facility. And there wasn't a lot out there. And we also, I also worked with Michael Crow and our realtors to look around because, you know, I, if we were gonna purchase this, property, I wanted to make sure that there wasn't something better out there. And there wasn't. And we've been in this building for a long time. Um, in the, we've been in the complex since I think the 90s or 80s, but we've been in this footprint since 2005. And in 2005, we had 136,000 registered voters. Currently, we have about 200,000 registered voters. So we are processing 64,000 more ballots through that facility. And we have people so packed in that space. And I knew it before, but COVID really magnified it because we had to split up our shifts. We could only have half the people working there at a time. But even when we did have 100% of the people working at a time, there was not a single extra chair in that building during a presidential election. We also don't have room for observers. And I've put in for three grants um, to help us build an observer corridor because transparency in our business now more than ever is very important, but we can't just have them walking around in such tight quarters. Um, you know, it, it needs to be in a space that is going to keep all of our ballots and elections secure. And we have a lot of bottlenecks because we desperately need a second sorter. And I know all of you have been in that facility and you know, it's a big modified mail sorter 
that takes a picture of the ballot signature and barcode when it comes in. And then we have to put it on after it gets signature verified to outsource this, the challenged ballots. And that's our bottleneck because you can't do both at the same time. We really need one sorter that does intake and one sorter that sorts out challenged ballots. So we don't have our workers waiting for work. Um, you know, we try really hard to time it, but it's, it's tough. And we've already invested an awful lot in this facility. We just pulled fiber a couple years ago. Um, we put in all new cameras last year. We put in this big, huge generator. So it will power that entire building in the event of a power outage. And that was a recommendation of Department of Homeland Security. And, you know, it's not just an office. It's not like picking up building one and moving to another facility. It's a highly customized space and it's designed for the path of a ballot. So it's it's not easy to replicate. And, you know, we really need to start tenant improvements now if we are going to be ready for the midterm elections in 2022. Um, so I really, please put this in the cap capital improvement plan. You know, if we don't close this deal on July 2nd, I don't know all the details, but you know, it's, it's a little frightening for me. Um, I feel like it's putting my continuity of operation elections at risk. And that's not a risk I want to take. And I hope it's not a risk you want to take either. And even if we got a great landlord and we didn't buy the building, our lease expires December 31st, 2024. That's a presidential election year. We are really busy in December of presidential election years, and I don't think we could get out of there in time. I really don't, you know, but I mean, because of your leadership, we have an opportunity to solve this issue. And I mean, you voted to purchase the building. I, I hope you please move forward with that. You know, and I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to also talk about the atrium. You know, we've been in the same footprint in that building since 1989. 1989 is when financial services moved to building four. Um, and everything we do on the first floor of building one is customer transactions. So I don't have staff that can telework. I mean, I have two workstations in our supply room. I have a, a workspace in the hallway. Um, you know, in, in 89, our population was 155,000 and they're estimating now it's over 300,000. So we do have a lot of space needs. And what really concerns me, you know, if we, if we don't do anything is we don't have a plan C. So yeah, anyway, I'm happy to answer any questions. That's all I have to say. Questions for Mary? I don't have questions for Mary. Um, actually, I, I do have one. Um, you mentioned last year, um, you know, you, you made a lot of Im improvements and then um, you also had to rent the SPSCC, which that was due uh, because we had the extra COVID money, correct? Right, because again, our footprint in building one, we didn't have space to have a, a, a voting center in there, which we usually take over room 152 as a voting center but there was no way we could have kept people safe because it, there would have been lines out the door and there was no way people could have um, social distanced. So that's why I moved it to SPSCC. And the only reason we were able to afford that um, was because of, we had a lot of grant money. We had almost a million dollars in grant money last year to conduct the presidential election. And we, we did not turn back a dime. We used every single penny of it. And the improvements that were done and the Motman building, um, it was because Homeland Security came down and basically said, you need to do this in order to have, uh, you know, a, a fair process in the election system. It, it really didn't have anything to do with the fair process. It had to do with the physical security of the building. Thank you. So we work with Department of Homeland Security a lot. In fact, I met with them last Friday and they're, <laughs> we were talking about what we could do with the Motman property because um, the gentleman I was talking to has been out there. He was the one who did our physical security assessment. I believe it was in, uh, I don't know, 2019 or late 2018. 
and they made a lot of recommendations. So for example, we put in USB blockers. So nobody could insert a USB drive in any of like our signature check computers, which are out in the open. Um, you know, they made suggestions on how to secure the computers that um, tally our results. So we put those in locked cabinets and uh, they just gave a lot of recommendations and and the generator was one of them also. And that was a very expensive generator. I wanted, it was, I don't remember the exact price, but um, it was not inexpensive because it can power that whole building. Thank you. Uh, Mary, you don't believe, I guess, that the Planning Commission heard this information. I mean, they didn't hear it from you. You haven't had any conversations with any of those folks or anything. And you did not testify the other day? To the Planning Commission? Yes. No, I did not. Uh, but I know they had our, the material about Motman for, for quite a while. Well, uh, I'm not sure that they did, to be honest with you. Some of this uh, information that we've had discussions on. Uh, so that, that's another issue. I mean, you're making a passionate plea, and I, uh, I'm i not critical of that whatsoever. I'm, I'm glad you're doing that. I just wonder how much the Planning Commission knew and when they knew it, I guess. Uh, but Jennifer, Jen got her hand up to answer your question. Oh, go ahead, Jennifer. Okay, is it okay? Yes, yes, sir. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Jennifer Davis, Community Planning Manager. So um, the Planning Commission had all of the typical information they would be provided for the uh, comprehensive plan amendment part of this. They do not have decision authority over budget expenditures by the Board of County Commissioners. So any of those intricate details about the budget or the leases, they did not have. They did have full information and a briefing by Robin um, on May 5th of this year um, before they set their public hearing that they held last week. And they had all of the same information that you see in your packet, which is the staff report and the project descriptions of both Motman and uh, the atrium building. Uh, I guess and I am very comfortable with the way Robin represents mm -hmm. this project. I think she has a very good understanding of it. But I guess I'm trying to get at, would have they heard any of our discussions? I'm not saying they couldn't have, possibly. They could have listened in or attended somehow. But as far as you know, have they heard anything of the discussions that we've heard you know, from Mary Hall about the need? That's what I'm wondering. I don't know if that was ever uh, actually transcribed into uh, a written language that they were provided. I, I just don't know the answer to that. Many, I see Robin's got her hand. Another one. Yeah. Many of those conversations were in executive sessions, Commissioner. Oh, okay. Uh, as far as the questioning on whether or not they have any budget authority at the Planning Commission, they, they probably don't, but they do have the responsibility, according to the Growth Management Act, to review how we expend the taxpayers' money. That's what they take into consideration as part of their. Uh, deliberations. So I don't want to disregard what the Planning Commission uh, felt, but on the other hand, we don't have anybody here from the Planning Commission today. We're, we're hearing uh, uh, from one side of the equation, if you will, but the Planning Commission doesn't have the liberty to be here to explain what they were talking about or thinking about, and I don't think they had all the information that we have had, so that's that's one issue. Uh, I've heard the COVID-19 issue here, social distancing issue here, uh, quite a bit. And to be honest with you, I sometimes get confused about what we discussed in uh, executive session versus what, what we discussed in open public meetings. It seems to me that we did discuss the possibility of utilizing some of the CARES money to assist us in making this purchase because of that uh, statement there. But uh, COVID-19, we, we need to have social distancing and address all that. And that might be 
part of the expenditure package. But then again, the other day, Robin said, no, we'd never even discussed that. And I don't know, Mary, I guess my question is for you. Haven't we kind of talked about the need because of COVID uh, for expanding and, and meeting some of those issues like social, social distancing and such? So I, I think COVID just magnified um, the reality that we needed more space. I mean, we need to be able to put more people in there. We didn't have enough people e in there even prior to COVID. We just didn't have the space to put them there. So um, we had half the people working there during COVID. So, so yeah, that really magnified the issue. It was a difficult election processing record number of ballots with more ballots than we've ever seen ever in Thurston yeah. County. Okay, but I mean, COVID is having a, a devastating impact on how we do business during yes, this election. And, and we don't know about what's coming down the pike, right? Right, and you know, I've talked to you know, our former grants manager, I've talked to um, our internal auditor and it would, you know, to use COVID dollars would be a very narrow focus. Um, you know, and as the auditor, I my responsibility is to keep us from getting audit findings. So we could not use those funds in any large way. It would be very narrow in scope. I mean, I'm not, Thing we couldn't use any, but it would be very narrow in scope and have to be very well documented. So, yeah, I, and I wanted another answer. I mean, I was waiting with bated breath for Treasury's guidelines to come out, and I have to say I was disappointed. And, um, and in national um, meetings with U.S. Senate staff, I asked for them to please allow us to use some of these funds for infrastructure. But so far, that hasn't happened. Okay. Uh, and this, I see uh, Robin had her hand up, I thought. No? Okay. So, uh, I still haven't got an answer. And this is, I, I'd like to have this, this discussion with legal. But with the lease agreements, what could have we ended up with as a move out date had we wanted to push forward with, I don't know if you want to call them property rights of a renter, uh, with that agreement, I've heard December 31st, 2024, that was in the written portion of it, but it didn't address the ability to continue beyond that date that uh, one of the earlier lease agreements had in it. So, and do, therein lies the risk. I, I, right, there, there is going to be a risk. Granted, uh, there could be litigation, but what was the final date that that uh, was on the horizon with considering risk that we could have went to, even though the property changed hands? That's my that's my question. Uh, well, I haven't in, heard an answer yet. You know, I've talked a lot with Elizabeth uh, Petrich, who's also my attorney. Um, there's a lot of risk with a new owner. I mean, they could totally raise our uh, lease payment. Um, it's not uncommon for people to get forced out. My chiropractor just did, <laughs> got forced out of his building. Um, and, you know, I know everybody says there's all this commercial real estate on the market but not the kind of commercial real estate that you need for a ballot processing center. And we've been in this space for a long time. It works for us. The path of a ballot works. I mean, it's not a pretty place, but we don't need a pretty place. We need a functional place. And it's very functional. And we would not be able to move out in December of 2024. There is no physical way possible and not break the law, election law. So, yeah. Okay, okay, I guess I guess still where I'm going is we still don't have legal here telling us, well, under the conditions of the original lease agreement, it had a provision in there that we could continue the lease and how that ties in with 
a renter's property rights, I, I don't know. I think legal probably would know if we had somebody that was an expert in that field. So that's, I, I, I am not questioning any of the need that you've laid out. I am questioning how much risk would there be with moving forward on continuing the lease. We're talking about going to the Atrium Project, nothing to do with what our discussion is today uh, at this point, and we're talking about expending, I don't know, $7 million in upgrades to accommodate an unowned piece of property. I don't know what we're talking about in upgrading the lease, uh, the needs of the auditor's office in a leased building if we move forward in that other arena. So I'm still curious about what the final date that an attorney could tell me, okay, yes, we could go ahead until uh, 2032 or something. I, I don't know, I'm just grabbing that out of the air. I haven't heard a date that says we could probably do that. Yes, maybe there'd be some litigation around it. I don't know that. We've never gotten an answer from legal on that issue. And getting information in writing does not allow for discussion of, well, what about this or what about that? So I think it's unfortunate for the citizens of Thurston County that the Planning Commission didn't get all the information maybe it needed, and we as commissioners didn't get all the information that we need. So I see now there's two hands up there, so looks like... Robin can go first. <laughs> go ahead, Robin. Um, so, <clears throat> with all due respect, Commissioner, you're asking for the impossible um, because um, no one can give you a firm date of when, you know, date certain we would have to leave if the building were sold. Uh, it, that depends on a lot of things. When would the purchase be? When? Uh, would the new owner, you know, what kind of terms could we come to with them? That's all negotiable. Uh, would the new buyer be buying the property to use themselves as we are? Or would the new buyer be uh, having an investment with the intent to lease the space? Would they lease more space to us or would they continue with the other tenants? Part of the reason we're talking about buying that building is Mary needs more room. And we're talking, we're looking at every current tenant lease and thinking about, can we ask those tenants to leave? Um, so, you know, we're not able to give you a date, but I see Elizabeth is with us now and so I would love to turn it over to her. Uh, could we hear from Mary Hall before that, just because she had her hand up? Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to say, you know, so we've been in this facility for so long, we've probably paid for it five times over with our lease payment. So um, that's something to consider. And, you know, I did speak with Elizabeth yesterday a couple times, and I understand that the Planning Commission is simply an advisory body, that you're not bound by their um, decision. They kind of just brushed it off. And I'm going to be very honest. I really feel that that meeting was very political and I do not want to be in the political crosshairs that is happening right now over space. The continuity of my election operations are at risk and I'm sorry, it is too big a risk for this county. So I would please put it in a capital improvement plan Let's buy these buildings. I'm gonna jump in real quick. Bye, Frank. Thank you, Mary. Um, before I go to Elizabeth, I just wanted to say, kind of responding to Commissioner Edwards, that the, this wasn't just a, the whole decision about Mottman, at least for me, wasn't just a, a dollars and cents. It wasn't like, well, can we save a little money by purchasing it versus what we're spending on the lease and let's, let's cost it. No, it was about, it was driven by what Mary just talked about, the need for more space. Um, 
And we can get into the ins and outs of how long we theoretically might have been able to stay there. But I'll just put on, on the table, that had not nothing to do, I'm not saying it's irrelevant, but that was not the driver of my decision of, of why, and again, as I pointed out the last meeting, I was the last one to come on board with the purchase amendment, but I did it for reasons that had nothing to do with this issue about what the new owners might do, might we get kicked out, could we save a little money here or there? It was about meeting the needs um, that I've been hearing about from Mary since the day I took office about the ballot processing center. The statistics she gave, you know, 136,000 registered voters and now we're over 200,000. Um, and we've got additional scrutiny and politicization of the voting, of the, of the, of the election process, which is ridiculous. But we've got to deal with it, and we've got to be, we've got to have the right facility to be above reproach. We do not want a situation where our election is is challenged or questioned in any way. That is a threat to our democratic processes. So, the drivers for me really, I mean, we can, I mean, I, I'll give Commissioner Edwards latitude to get into the, the lease and all this stuff, but it's really not what this decision is about for me. I just want to put that out there. Elizabeth, I believe, is here. Uh, I don't know how much of the discussion she's heard, but are you there, Elizabeth? Yes, I am, Commissioner. I'm going to let Commissioner Edwards have a key. You have a question for Elizabeth? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and just to be fair, I've only heard pieces of this conversation, and I have not been involved in any of the legal advice related to the um, comprehensive plan just to uh, I just wanted to share that okay. and I'm trying to put my video on sorry that's okay thank you okay uh, I think rather than formulate a question for you at this point in time but we'll see what this uh, develops into we're talking about leases and legalities of leases it is my understanding that the original lease agreement that's been extended many times for the auditor's office gave certain protections and possibilities for continuation uh, on down the road for years to come. And then there was something that went on in the, the owner's situation I, and I guess maybe the owner died and then it was a, an estate issue. Now we're told that well maybe those provisions would hold up but but maybe not and so I'm gonna kind of jump to another topic just quickly because I believe it's pertinent. We're talking about leasing another building down in Olympia, uh, it's called the Atrium. And we're talking about a seven year lease and even possibly during that period of time, we're gonna to do some serious upgrades uh, if, if it happens. And during that period of time, we're thinking about trying to come up with a long-term solution here for the courthouse. The problem being, I'm hearing that leases are not like owning the building. So uh, say this atrium business, the principal owner in that dies and it goes into an estate foreclosure. Does that mean they can just break the lease and kick us out? We don't have any more protections than I'm hearing about lease protections now and the provisions that are written into those protections. And that's why I'm questioning this whole thing. I truly believe the Planning Commission just did what they thought they uh, hearing a, a little bit about it. I don't think they knew all the information about the need and all that. Uh, so I would like to have somebody from the Planning Commission. I hope they're, they're listening, but uh, we've had a presentation from Mary who we want to do this with. I think we should have had somebody from the Planning Commission here, possibly, uh, explaining to us. But anyway, so we have an inability for leases to grant us uh, no concerns, I guess, no, uh, no legal threat on one hand. Okay, it's no problem over here. 
But on this hand, if we try to continue the lease, well, no, there's been an extenuating circumstance, and so they're gonna be able to kick us out. I still don't know if there was ever a date certain that could be given that we could attempt to obtain occupancy for that period of time. And that's what I was looking for from council. And if you haven't heard our total discussions, I, I can't expect you to make an instantaneous decision. But again, that comes back to some of my bugaboo stuff about always having legal available to us, at least to hear our conversations when we ask these very technical uh, questions. Is a lease in the uh, 3000 building a completely different deal and we're locked in with good guarantees and the lease in the Motlin building for the auditor, that's not such a good deal. And so we don't have the ability to extend or we do have the ability to extend and we would probably succeed if it went to court. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. I'm trying to protect the taxpayers as best as I possibly can. As a matter of clarification, we do not have a lease on the atrium. Well, I know we don't, So uh, th we're that, talking about it, right? We do not have a lease on the atrium. Yeah, I know we don't, but so, we're uh, talking about the fact that we're well, going to lease the building. That's, that's the decision the board needs to take. I, uh, I know, I know. Maybe we're not going to do it. I, I don't know. But on one hand, the lease is concrete, so to speak, and gives us all the protection and no risk. And on the other hand, the lease is, well, maybe, and maybe not. And that's what I'm looking for. I want to make the best deal for the taxpayers of Thurston County. And so I would like to have that kind of information. And possibly, Elizabeth, no, with all respect, I think sometimes we need a specialty person that maybe deals in leases and such as a full-time deal. And I don't know why we can't have that kind of advice when we're making multi-million dollar decisions for the taxpayers. That's all I'm asking. So I, I know I've worked with Elizabeth for years and years and years, and she's got expertise, I'm sure, in certain fields like you would. Uh, so that's all I'm asking. We either have protections or we don't when we have leases. So that's and, kind of my- you know, Regardless of whether we buy it or continue leasing it, I still need more space. I, I Mary, um, I agree and, with you. I agree and, with you. But, but if we open up that lease, you know, with a new owner, we don't have the the same guarantees. I mean, I mean, still we'd want the attorneys to win, but I'm fairly certain that's how it works. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Let's let Elizabeth answer some of your questions. Yes, sir. If possible. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Um, yes, I hear there's a, a lot of confusion and concern about what the lease says and does not say. And, um, neither myself or either of the other attorneys in my office that I'm aware of have actually seen the lease. I agree it's important to understand the lease provisions. Um, we have not been asked to look at the lease yet. We're happy to look at the lease. Uh, uh, yes, yes, we have. Yes. Yeah. We did. Yeah, we did. The Scott Cushion provided that perspective that I just yeah. read at the beginning of the meeting. Okay, who who looked at the lease from my office? Scott Cushing. Okay. And he okay. had the original lease and the amendment. Okay, so you've been working with Scott then? Yes. Okay. And that's what I provided at the beginning of the meeting, Elizabeth, you probably missed that. And, and that's what I read, uh, his uh, perspective of, of trying to answer Commissioner Edwards' questions of last week. Okay, so where are, where are we? So, um, I don't know if you commissioner would like to. Yeah. See what you missed, Commissioner? <laughs> <laughs> You're only really getting half of the excitement. <laughs> I need to jump off and go to another conference, but thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Hey, Mary, do you have somebody sticking around that's from your office that'll be listening in? Uh, you know, we've got the state election conference going on right now, and we've got some pretty important session that started at 10 o'clock. So um, 
Luckily, it's all recorded. I, yeah, yeah, you can watch it later. That's right. Okay. Okay. I do have somebody who just sent me a message that said they will stay on. So. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Mary. Commissioner Mejia, what do you make out of all this? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did see um, the video from um, the recording from last week, and I saw the planning uh, commission uh, meeting um, to try to catch up for today and see what was where we were uh, headed. Um, I was honestly surprised and, and confused that the Motman was even a topic of discussion. Um, this has been an issue that we've been discussing since January. This was not a request by staff. It was a request by an elected office that came to us, um, you know, because of this change where uh, the owner had passed away and we had this opportunity. Um, the fact that we're starting to nitpick this so late in the game where we've already approved this and we're now backtracking, to me, it shows the inconsistence and we cannot keep doing this, um, especially for something that we've been briefed many times over, both in executive sessions and work sessions, uh, where Auditor Hall has in many occasions described the need for, her, for the space um, and you know, we are, we are this far and, and now we're trying to backtrack. I just, it does not make sense to me. And, you know, the planning commission, again, I, I believe what Mary said, they, uh, they are an advisory board. Um, and I agreed with what Commissioner Menser said at the previous meeting where in issues where they've had all the work sessions and all the executive sessions where they've had many hours where they've reviewed things um, you know, I, I will take their word on it, but this has been an issue that came to the board and we've had many work sessions and we've had many executive sessions where this issue has been discussed over again, where we um, had a, a report with many other properties and we saw those other properties and we saw what would fit and we didn't find a, a fit and that's why we decided this. Um, it, it's just, I guess I'm just confused about this. Like why, why now, you know, again, I, I believe that the planning commission, you know, has not had the time to review this as much as we had. So I am with what we've reviewed and what we've, uh, you know, I feel like we have the expertise in this uh, side of things because we have had the time to review this many times over and ask our questions and talk to legal and talk to professional staff about this. Um, and for us to just keep delaying this, it just throws away everything that we've done so far. And that honestly to me shows the bureaucracy of uh, certain things of us trying to delay things when we've had the time to review things over and over again and ask questions. And so I, so that's, that's where I'm at. Um, on this, I. So, just to, do we need to? Uh, is there an item on today's agenda that we're going to touch on? Yes, sir. Can we like cut this off and then we can discuss the when we get to that item whether we want to keep set the public hearing or not and just let the uh, commissioners make their statement? I, I I'm ready to make a decision. Yeah, I, I think it will be good. I mean, to find this conversation feel comfortable, right? Uh, because we need we need direction. Um, and, and, and the direction is whether that item to set the public hearing must forward. If it does, under under what umbrella the board will actually have the public hearing coming up. Well, there's two, you know, there's there's two elements of like protection here. One is that all this is is giving us the opportunity to to make an, another move, right? It's adding it to the capacity plan. It's not actually signing a lease or, no, or no. building doing it's, any it's, it's, it's Secondly. It's just setting a public hearing, at which time we'll get more input and have another discussion. So there's two separate layers removed from an actual action yeah. here. Um, so I'm getting frustrated that we're getting hung up in this very preliminary piece of um, the, 
process, the bureaucratic process. I know Commissioner Edwards doesn't like the bureaucratic process. I don't like it right now very much either. So um, that's why I'm trying to shortcut this a little bit, only because there's these additional layers of discussion and consideration that will happen. But, but, uh, but I believe is, uh, uh, is, is the board should be intent as to what elements you'd like to include in the, in the capital facilities plan amendment. So between the, the two, you mean? Yeah, between the two. The, all the two, one of them or not. Got it. And, well, can and, we make that, that kind of, that. can we give our thumbs on that when we go through the agenda and get to that piece, do you think? Or does, uh, if, I guess I'm asking my seat if, if, are we, yeah. do we need to have more, are there questions you need answered right now before we get to that final discussion whether to set this public hearing before we, because we got a long agenda to go through. I'm not sure. I want, I want to meet Mary's needs. I really do. But we talk about we've had legal discussions with this, and as far as I know, we have not had these type of discussions where the legality. I made my decision initially based on what Mary needed, or what the auditor needed, and the information from staff that, well, we got to get out of here because if we don't get out of here, we're going to get thrown. The guy died and everything's changed and the lease will be up and we've got a presidential election coming up 24 and we can't do it then. That's why I went the way I went. If we can stay there for uh, 10 more years, regardless if it's old hands or if it changed hands, that's a completely different ballgame. But that's me. not meeting the, the needs of the auditor because we've got those other tenants in there. We well, can't, she can't expand and do all the things she said. I mean, we didn't, we didn't really explore that because we decided to go right into that's where we're, making we're having, a purchase. That's where we're having a difference. I mean, yeah. I don't I remember that being all we explored. Yes. We didn't explore at all the idea that we might, that, that we, we might have to get out of there because the, it's been sold and they might kick us out. I mean, that's what we really didn't explore. I don't know where well, you. No, I don't know what meeting you were at, but the threat we did not. Explore. No, it was about this is an opportunity for us to potentially meet the needs of the auditor, control the space, so we don't have to worry about all this negotiation. That's why you, you know, that is why you buy a building or build a building. Um, we don't have that option when it comes to the entirety of county government. That's why we're looking at the atrium. But we do have this limited option with the auditor and, the, and a very specialized type of space with ballot processing. And that's what the whole conversation was from my recollection. It wasn't about this emergence like, oh, if we don't do this, we're going to have to, we're going to get displaced. I mean, I, I know that that was talked about in passing, but... That was not the. That was not the full conversation. That was not the. Yeah, it was not the okay. intent. No, I'm, I'm not saying it was. It was just part of it. Uh, no, I I think we're okay to move on and make sure we get back to this. I just don't think. Okay. Well, we'll come up with it. regardless of who thinks what, why, I just think that we need more. In, when we make decisions, if we don't have all of the information, we can't make good decisions. So when we're told that well, you're going to be out of here. Oh, but come to find out, oh no. The lease provisions are different than what we were, than what was explained to us. That's all I'm saying. I mean, you get to negotiate a certain amount of, and you're talking about the certainty, I think is the word you were kind of playing with there. Like, this, what kind of certainty do we have when we're in a lease? Yep. And it's what you've negotiated with the owner. I mean, it might be, might be three years of certainty, like in the atrium, it's going to be seven years of certainty and a couple of certain uh, options. I, I think so. three more one year. I think we have like 10 years of certainty. At that point, you don't have certainty. That's why leasing is not as, not as preferable as buying a building, purchasing a building. We need a lot more money to do that. But I don't right. think we've ever had that answer concrete from on Mottman, that, on Mottman or on the atrium as far as what protections does a lease give you? You've got it written in a certain way. How binding is it? How long does it, you've got extensions wrote in that you can do extensions if you need to. How binding is that? What about when it changes hands? Does that go, is that binding to the new owner? I don't know those those answers. And that was what, that would be part of the decision process. That's all I'm, I just want all the information. That's all I want. I want to help Mary too, but I don't want to get in trouble with the taxpayers doing something. I mean. We've done some dumb things over the years. We bought a fish plant and it sat empty for 17 years, millions of dollars. 
We didn't use it. We finally got rid of it. We built a jail. It sat empty for about five years before we used it. And even now, it's not perfect. So all I'm saying is I'm trying to make good decisions about what we do. We're going to fill this building with ballots, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's, okay. um, let's, let's move from what's item three. We'll revisit this again in item four. <laughs> so, uh, my, my, my hope is that you have enough time for your executive session because I have been delaying this executive session for quite some time. So um, just county managers telling us to move along. Well, let's quickly. work. See we, we can, can do it. Guys. We can work through lunch. Order lunch. We'll stay right here. All right. This is a pretty long agenda as we went through last, but we went through it last week and um, hopefully there'll be less questions today because we asked a lot last week. So this is a, uh, this afternoon's board meeting agenda, June 8th. Meeting gets called to order at 2 p.m. Uh, Vice Chair Edwards will call, uh, will lead the Pledge of Allegiance. We'll have consideration of the agenda and board meeting minutes and a presentation for LGBTQ plus Pride Month. Um, anything to be, Amy, uh, on that? Yes, we have representatives from uh, Capital City Pride who will be uh, joining us this afternoon to accept the proclamation. Questions? Do you know that we'll be in person or uh, via Zoom? I think uh, a couple plan to attend in person and uh, some over Zoom. Oh, great. Perfect. That would be very exciting. Thank you. The opportunity for the public to address the board will follow. County manager's update. Anything? Yes, uh, and uh, I will touch base on the public testimony. This related to Ms. Delworth. Um, uh, testimony you received a couple of weeks ago. I do have a planned response. Uh, maybe I can touch base if there's time to do the public testimony. I agree to address that right now. Can we get to on the on item number one of commissioner items. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's do that. Um, consent and item three A. So items three A, B, and C are related to a uh, the uh, general obligation funds that we. Uh, 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 refinance and, and so on is to create uh, really the necessary funds uh, to manage the, the expenditures and the revenues and expenditure, expenditures of, of, of the bonds. One, the first one is related to the ERP implemented systems, and the, uh, uh, the other two are related to the debt service fund, which is re we refinance. We had a discussion that uh, last week. Um, if you have any questions, I'm sure we can answer those as well. And again, it's items 3, A, B, and C. No questions. No questions. Let's go to 3D, Sheriff's Office. It is a yearly uh, request for you to authorize an, applica mm -hmm. authorize an application to conduct the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> uh, regatta uh, event in Black Lake, which is uh, on the weekend of July uh, 10th and 11th, 2021. And uh, the uh, sheriff's office has reviewed all the necessary elements of this application and is recommending your approval. Question on the regatta? No, sir. No, sir. Uh, I want to say for the record, for the public, that the some of these items we see for the first time in the agenda setting, some of them we have separate. And so when we when we go quickly through three A, B, and C, they're big items. We've had separate, distinct briefings with council on those above and beyond agenda setting. Yeah, so okay. thank you. Just making sure folks are clear of why we're moving pretty quickly there. Yeah, I'll be right back. Okay. Three A is human resources. Yeah, the next item, uh, the next item as well, is for you to consider a reclassification. Uh, uh, senior human, um, senior human resources to an analyst, analyst to a, a human resources analyst position. And this particular reclassification uh, results on. Uh, a reduction of the budget from $8,249 a month to $7,668 a month, a reduction of $581, a 7% decrease. And this is a way as to uh, how uh, Maria Ponti, the director, has looked as to how she better uh, meet the needs of the business by this reclassification. Any questions? No, sir. HR reclassification? Anything? No, sir. Okay, well, let's move on. We have public health and social services. Uh, uh, 3F and 3A are related to the um, 
to the housing and homeless prevention uh, areas of our business in, in public health social, and social services. Uh, as you may know, uh, those two individuals holding those positions have been, uh, we have been added additional activities, including the managing the regional housing council, and managing many other aspects related to the housing. So it's only just for us to address those uh, additional uh, um, functions that we have put on them to uh, go through a reclassification. So the first reclassification related to that is item 3F. The, uh, it reclassifies the existing uh, uh, social services program specialist to a program manager. And again, it's in the Office of Housing and Homeless Preve Prevention. Uh, and the impact on the budget is from $7,321 to $7,900 a month. There will be an increase of $579 a month or 8%. Um, uh, most of that is uh, the, the department is not asking for an additional budget authority. And most of their functions are covered by a grant. It's not necessarily a general fund. That is item three. Yeah. Three F and, and then you're going to Yeah, separate. and three uh, G is also related to the same work unit. And this particular request is to reclassify the program manager to a senior program manager in the same function. So we just move those uh, uh, currently. And the impact on the budget on this one is from $7,900 a month to $8,843 a month. That would be a $943 increase, a 12% increase. And again, those are not funded uh, by the general fund. And those are funded by uh, many different grants that we receive. And the, the department is not asking additional budget authority as a result of this classification. No questions. No, sir. Okay, let's move on to 3H, also health. Yeah, for your consideration, you also review this, uh, for you to consider re, uh, revising uh, the, um, the environmental health program manager uh, job description to uh, have a, uh, an 18 month delay in receiving the registered sanitary and credentials. You uh, had that conversation last week. There is not an impact on the budget because the the, the budget still remains the same on this classification. Um, and uh, you asked to be a little more clear on the description if we add it uh, on the description to the, the specific change on the job classification to have a delay of 18 months for the incumbent to secure the registered sanitary and credential. I think that is going to give us a lot more latitude to uh, and, and, and recruitment and retention um, of this position. No questions. No questions. Okay. Uh, I and GA auditors uh, voucher list. Questions from commissioners on that? No, sir. Okay. Uh, I guess as an administrative point, this is typically when we take a break. Uh, do we want to forego that today or um, keep your me? Keep going. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think at some point we need it. doesn't to... happen often. It's usually <laughs> pretty rigid about those breaks, but we're, we're pretty far behind. Let's go on to item four, contract award for Tilly Building uh, in HVAC. Yeah, you also review this item, commissioners, and this is for you to consider to um, award a contract for uh, $91,476. It includes the base bid as well as the uh, sales tax and 10% contingency to capital hearing and calling corporate of Gracie Washington and this is to provide a, uh, 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 improvements on the intake of the HVAC system in Building E of the Polar Wars Campus located at Tilly Road. Uh, that will be at 9521 Tilly Road Southeast. Uh, on May 17th, uh, staff uh, received three bids and, uh, and capital heating and cooling incorporated in Washington was a little better. And that is the request for you today. Any more questions last week? Um, no, sir. No questions. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, item five. And, and the funding goes comes from building reserves. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Mentioned that. Item five is CPED. It's a setting a public hearing for capital improvement. So here we are. Here, here. we are. <laughs> <laughs> Took our five minutes. <laughs> um, all right. So now we basically just need to decide we're setting this hearing and on what the scope of that hearing will incorporate. 
So uh, to reframe uh, the, the options the board has, um, the, board, uh, the planning commission provided recommendations for you. One is not to add the uh, atrium as part of the amendment of the capital facilities plan. And the other recommendation was a delay of the monument property, uh, purchase of the monument property. So as a default, they are not recommending, including at this point, any of the two projects. So the options the board has is um, if, uh, if you concur uh, with the recommendations of the planning commission, this item is not needed because no amendments will occur. Uh, if you like to exercise your legislative authority, you have the option to modify their, uh, their recommendations either by including one or the other, or just go with no, uh, no accepting the recommendations of the planning commission and you can include those two projects and that will lead to a, uh, um, a public hearing as well. Both, one or zero? I am ready to move forward with setting the public hearing. On and, both items? On both items. Sure. Both well, one or zero? I have been opposed to the atrium all along. So that puts me in the dilemma. Uh, I want to help Mary, but I want to make sure that we do it right. That's my whole thing. So uh, I don't know that we're there yet. I, uh, Commissioner Mejia doesn't, uh, I have to say, I respect your position on how can this delay take forever, uh, but I want it done right. And so I'm probably going to oppose this because. I'm going to go along with the planning commission. I just don't think they had all the information. And I think they're a group of citizens that have concerns. We put them in that position. And I, I'd even like to hear from them before we make that decision. Let me ask something of the county manager. Do we, are we obligated to, I mean, it seems like we're always on, under the gun right up to the, you know, the time is we got this and if we don't do this we can't do that does this mean that we can only make this decision today we can't make it tomorrow to, to set the public hearing yes. yes because we uh we need to have the public hearing set for june 22nd and uh, uh in association with the overall budget amendments they, they also have going to have a budget hearing so those two need to go together one is the the allowance of, uh, in the capital facilities plan, and the other is the expenditure that you want to be approving as part of the amendment. I'm probably going to vote against this at this point. I mean, I okay, but we got we got the democratic process go working here. We'll see what happens. But um, okay, I'm going to move to. Um, I think that I think you're right to an extent that the planning commission didn't have all as much information as we've had because we've been working on this for a really long time. I think if they heard what the auditor said this morning, the monument would be a slam dunk. As to the atrium, I read their addendum. They bring up a lot of good questions, questions that we've been asking, questions that we will continue to ask, questions that caused us to pause the letter of intent and get to get a little bit more information. And we won't move forward until some of these things are, are, are ironed out. And I, I, I know the answers to some of the things in here, and a couple of them I don't, and that's why we paused. But this is an intermediate step. This is the allowance to give us the option to do this. So I don't see this as something that needs to be held up at this juncture. So I am in favor. And, and we're going to get public comment at the public hearing, and we we'll always have the latitude to, to go a different direction. So I favor putting both items to a public hearing on the 22nd of June. Let me just record the. Um, so it looks like we'll have. Uh, uh, on 5A, presumably we'll have a vote to set that public hearing. Yeah, so uh, just, to be, just to be clear, um, you would like to keep this item for you to take a formal action this afternoon to set the public hearing uh, to include uh, the atrium uh, as part of the amendment of the capital facilities fund as well as the purchase of the monument property. And you're not making a decision on that, you just Bring those, bring those items for public hearing. I'm uh, deciding to get more public input. Right. Yes. I'm deciding. Yeah. I'm okay with that. <laughs> so just to be clear, you're not approving those two projects right. Right. at this point. Um, okay, and that brings us to 5B. Uh, setting a public hearing, also under CPED, 
setting a public hearing for extension ordinance for economic security and relief. Yeah, this for consideration commission is for you to set the public hearing where you uh, uh, receive public testimony for uh, the option for you to extend ordinance 15942, which is uh, extends the deadlines for building and land use applications uh, for the community planning and economic development until September 2021. The last action we took collapse in uh, uh, March, so those will be retroactive to the last time which you took an action. I believe this is a uh, uh, well needed uh, uh, help and relief related to the impacts the government has caused in the construction uh, uh, industry. And before you can take a formal action on this, uh, you need to set a public hearing, and this is the item for your consideration. Also, you may recall that you already passed a resolution extending similar items to public health. Uh, so those two are just coincide on the same timeline. No questions. I, I guess um, my only concern about this and on other extensions, I've raised the same issue, is September 1st added or September 30th. Or September 30th. And then do we just have to go through it all again and all that? And that's why and maybe if we can make that decision after the public hearing, uh, yes, if, if we wanted to, could we extend it to the end of the year so we could do it all in one action? So we don't have to go through it again. That's the only thing. We don't know what's coming on, on COVID. We think we're ahead of it, uh, but there's been economic issues all the way along that are affecting the building industry. So that's my only concern. So I yes, I wanna set the hearing. I guess when we get done with the hearing, we can always make a decision do we want to bump it up? It, it, you know, we're not locked in on that data set of the other side. Uh, I think, no, that's the proposal. Uh, but certainly, as, as, as you stated, it's just my perspective, you stated you, you don't know how the condition is going to change COVID 19 and the effects. Also, we can look the, from the other perspective. We don't know what by September 30th how the economy should be. So it gives you the latitude for the board to assess the current conditions before you uh, continue beyond the September 30th. Okay. Brett, anything, I see you're up there. Anything you want to add on this item? Good to go. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, thank you for the great summary, uh, County Manager. Thanks, Brett. Okay, emergency services item 6A, interlo interlocal cooperative agreement for Thurston County Disaster Recovery Council. Yeah, you reviewed this item maybe a month ago uh, where uh, this uh, interlocal agreement is to set uh, the um, the Thurston County Disaster Recovery Council, and this is the result back in, uh, when we, some of us, attended the uh, the like, interim emergency management course back in uh, February 2019. Uh, when we presented this item, um, you know, it was a little bit of a conversation with what's the obligation that each of the jurisdictions will have related to funding. So that has been softened the language. And also you asked the question related to what the other jurisdictions are, are going to. Um, I, I touch base with some of the city managers there in the process of uh, uh, looking at this particular LA and I think they are going to uh, process and finalize that. I think the first county should take the lead. And obviously, this agreement doesn't is fully executed until the jurisdictions are participating, but uh, taking the first action, I think, is adequate. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think Kurt is here with us. Services right here. No questions at this time. No, sir. No. Okay, yeah. We'll take the lead, and this is going to be a good thing if we can get everybody on board, and I think we will. So, thank you. Anything, Kurt, to add? Uh, no, I think the county manager summed it up fairly well. Appreciate your time this morning. 7A Public Health and Social Services, sole source purchase of Gelota case management systems. So, uh, as a friend uh, in the three items, 3A, 3B and 3C are related. In every to 7A, 7B, and 7C. Thank okay. you. Uh, and this is related to the, the lead that will be the law enforcement system diversion program. As you may know, we'll receive a grant uh, from the Healthcare Authority, I believe, uh, to have a pilot project related to lead. We have been working on this uh, with uh, internal stakeholders. So the first item for you is uh, for you to authorize a sole source for us to purchase. Uh, the software uh, for the collection management of this particular uh, element. This is uh, a maximum amount of $52,200. And the reason as to, I believe you, you had this conversation last year as to why it's a sole source, because the grantor 
it's required for us to use this particular application. So that is why it's a sole source at this point. Question on 7A. So basically, the, the software piece that goes with lead. With lead. No questions at this time. Sure. No, sir. Okay. Uh, and then we've got 7B and C, which are related again. 7B, this is the result of the request for proposals uh, that we conducted and were authorized to go ahead and do so, is to secure the services, uh, item 7B, uh, uh, for uh, case management uh, services uh, in support of the, again, the lead program pilot project that will be, again, the law enforcement assisted diversion program. And uh, this particular the request for proposals was, was reviewed, all the proposals received, and, uh, and the recommendations for you to consider one, the contract to Olympic, Olympic Health and recovery services for the amount of $187,110. And again, this will be for the case management services of uh, the, uh, the lead program. And this will go through December 31st, 2021. That's when the pilot uh, project is uh, supposed to be lapsing. Marianne, I'm very scared if you have any questions related to this. Marianne, can you just, this, I think this is really important to, for you to describe the, um, the committee and the, the, you know, is making this recommendation, um, just to kind of have that layer of vetting. Commissioner Edwards and I obviously sit on the board of those organizations and we have been out of this process. So I'd like you to describe where these recommendations are coming from from your point. I'd be glad to. So the, uh, the, there was a, uh, two panels in reality because the request for proposals was a two part case management services and program management services because uh, case management services are those direct services provided to the individuals who law enforcement refers to the lead program and who uh, voluntarily choose to participate. So those direct services are uh, the case management services. And then there's also the program management services component, which is the next part on your agenda. And so uh, program management services are those uh, big picture community engagement, community advisory board, looking for additional resources, uh, uh, bigger picture services that are provided uh, uh, to look at how this uh, model works in your community for uh, meeting fidelity to how it operates. So when we released the request for proposals, we were looking for two different service providers with two different sets of skills, that direct services and that community partnership, community engagement. And so uh, very different sets of activities. And so when we set up the panel, how, panels, however, there are two different panels, uh, but we were looking for a set of uh, domains, if you were to, uh, in system understanding, that were very similar uh, for people selected to look at uh, uh, and review those proposals that came in. We were looking for folks who had a law enforcement experience, criminal justice experience, behavioral health experience, and public health experience, because uh, LEAD as a program is, is foundationally set on uh, those areas working together in order for it to work well. So the panel, uh, the panels that were selected were uh, our contracts and grants um, uh, staff advises no less than three, and uh, to have some folks from inside and outside, so community members as well, review the proposals based on a set of criteria, which of course were uh, in the um, RFP for them. And um, uh, those scores uh, were uh, summarized and shared with the uh, steering committee. The final, the final summarized uh, scores were shared with the steering committee that was, has been helping to start up and kind of direct and support uh, the startup of the LEAD uh, program here in Thurston County. And then uh, those results, which um, the county manager can also uh, share with you, uh, uh, because he assists, he has been assisting in the startup as well. It uh, were looked over and uh, discussed, and consensus that the top scoring proposals were very consistent with what uh, 
they would also recommend to you no changes uh, the, with the community, with the panels recommended, uh, or exactly what the steering committee would also recommend to you, which of course it's your decision. But uh, I would say though, it's, it's uh, highly competitive. We have really quality providers of service in Thurston County, which is something that we're really lucky. Um, for and so the top recommended the top uh, the top scoring proposal proposals um, which you have uh, here presented to you um, the steering committee recommends to you and uh, that is a, a short summary of what um, the process was. And I'm going to make an even shorter summary. The, the the scoring was done by the panels. The top scores were were. Uh, sent to the steering committee, and those top scorers are being recommended to the board. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Because that doesn't always happen. I so I want to make that really clear. Sometimes oh. a decision is made to go with somebody who's not the top scorer. But in this oh, case, okay. it's been very much. Um, and, and it was being part of that conversation was by consensus, as uh, yes. Mariana stated. Okay. Very good. Pretty sure. Yeah. No questions at this time. No questions. Okay. Great. Thank you, Mariana. Appreciate that background. Um, that takes us through 7B and C. Let's go to 7D, an interlocal agreement with City of Olympia for scattered site pilot project. So items, uh, the next three items are related to the same item, and this is related to the scattered site. Uh, the first item, 7D, is to uh, uh, have uh, an interlocal agreement with City of Olympia uh, for a start guiding. That would be the instrument in which we uh, pay for some of the services the associated with the uh, scatter site is for $240,000. And, and 7E is the actual contract with the city. So, and you had a conversation last week. This is not a 480,000 uh, impact. This is one of the same. It's just we need to uh, take a couple of different steps to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that is related to the scatter site uh, thing. And item 7F. It's really just to, uh, uh, you know, not just, it's to approve a contract with angels uh, for angels, uh, and that will be the actually case management and governance services related to the scatter site pilot project. This is a pilot project, and this is for, a, 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 the intent is to go for up to a year. Every in the six months, we'll have a check-in to see how well it's working, but you are not committed beyond a one year. And that is, I think, is a good, uh, uh, clarification to make for the public because this is a, a, an opportunity to see how this pilot project will work because the initial idea to create a, a parking, uh, uh, a fixed parking spot for the RVs uh, located on Ensign Road just didn't materialize in terms of cost, in terms of uh, logistics. So this is an alternative to that. We'll see how the pilot project uh, will work in, in the regional housing council has uh, recommended uh, this uh, this approach is again just the instruments in which we can start working into this uh, pilot project. Tom, have any questions? But, yeah, Tom, I know last week we went through the fact that the numbers are a little higher because we've expanded this to a year from the original idea of six months. Anything That's else? correct. Anything else you want to throw in there before I go to Commissioner Mejia? Not at this time. That was a, a good summary, but happy to answer any questions. I have no questions at this time. No questions. Okay, very good. I don't either. Um, this is, we'll see how this goes. Item 7G is setting a public hearing for program year 2021 HUD annual action plan. Yeah, commissioners. Um, uh, this, uh, the House and Urban Development requires for you to, requires for you to uh, set a public hearing and have public testimony related to the 2000. This is the 2021 uh, <clears throat> action plan. The action plan needs to be aligned uh, with the uh, five-year consolidated plan, which the board approved the consolidated plan back in 2018, and the consolidated plan was from 2018 and 2022. Uh, the the, the uh, elements included in this particular public hearing will be the county receives called Home investment partnership uh, monies, community development grant programs, and, and all those are coming from the U.S. Housing and Urban Development, uh, and provides many different uh, 
uh, activities associated with low-income households as well as individuals. And, and next week's agenda for the 15 is a little more in detail some of the award uh, uh, grants that you might be considering. So again, this is for you to set a public hearing. Well, you will be receiving public testimony related to the uh, uh, 2021 uh, in, uh, annual action plan uh, related to the housing urban development. And I think Tom is here with any questions. Questions on this item? No questions on this item. No, sir. No, straightforward. Thank you. It's a big time. Item 8, a public works contract for 2021 overlay project for Rainier Road overlay project. Yeah, uh, you also review this item. This is the uh, way to award the contract to Lakeside Industry Industries of Lacey, Washington. It has two elements the 2021 overlay project and uh, it's an overlay of right near Road uh, Street. And uh, this is a good partnership with the uh, city of Rainier because they can benefit from the uh, economy of scale. Uh, this particular uh, contract, the department is asking for you to award a total of four million eight hundred thirty-five thousand five hundred forty dollars it will include a 10 percent contingency since the load bill by lakeside industry was four million three hundred ninety six thousand two hundred nineteen dollars the department in may 20th received about five years in which the lakeside industry was the load debtor related to this particular project um, uh, i can elaborate more but if you have any questions please give me that question on overlay no sir no sir and the funding comes from the county uh, both fund as well as from the real estate excise tax Chief. perfect no questions from all of me eight e contract award for Vail road improvements phase two project also for you to consider awarding the contract to active construction uh incorporated of the all of washington for a total award of two million one hundred fifty-seven thousand six dollars, which includes a ten percent contingency, since they were the no letters with one million nine hundred sixty thousand nine hundred sixty dollars. On May six, the department received seven bids, and active construction was the low better, and that will be to provide the improvements of Bell Road from one thirty-eighth Avenue South Southeast to one fifty-third Avenue Southeast. Uh, this particular uh, project has a significant funding from the County Road Administration Board in the order of $1,800,000. Uh, and that has been, uh, and the, the remainder, which is just about, uh, uh, I believe, uh, close to 200000 will be coming from the County Road Fund. Is that the question? Any questions from the board? No, sir. No, no sir. We don't have any questions. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Is it getting easy? It's <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're teaching them that they add so many items that you know they don't get any questions. But no, to, to do just that, I mean, last week you review in depth. Yeah, all those yeah, exactly. Commissioner Mejia was not part of it. I, I watched the video and I, I okay. some of my answers got answered. So, <laughs> all right, eight C, um, setting a public hearing for proposed. Transportation impact fees rate schedule. Yeah, for your consideration is for you to set the public hearing for July 13, 2021 at 3 in the afternoon in this building for you to receive public testimony to the traffic updates of the traffic impact fees. You have uh, several briefings on this, and this is the result of the direction of the board. I believe it's a unanimous direction to for you to go ahead and receive public testimony. They will address uh, the uh, update of the project list. <laughs> I believe that the, the direction at this point is to have a 50% uh, uh, reduction of the of the allowed traffic impact fees, and also you included uh, reductions, additional reductions on uh, uh, ADUs as well as uh, low income housing, uh, and those are the three elements that I believe I can go in more detail. But that's the the frame which this public hearing will be set. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, the only question I have that's uh, uh, kind of manic here is, is this something we're required to do every year? Mm -hmm. No, sir. But if we want to make any changes, we have to do it, right? If we have to make any changes. This, it, I think, is a time. The last time okay. was in 2011, I believe. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Good. And as projects roll through, it's like it's prudent to update. It's my recollection. Yeah, yeah. It's, okay, it, I'm fine. It's really the, the 
key element is, is the project needs, needs to be updated. I, I got it. Okay. okay. Sheriff's Office 9, contract extension with North Clear Sioux School District. Yes. Um, for your consideration is to uh, approve the contract extension with the North Pearson School District, District to provide uh, uh, resource officers um, on North Pearson uh, High School, I believe, and uh, middle schools. And it's called middle schools and, and a couple of uh, uh, elementary schools. And this uh, particular item uh, will be from the school year 2021-2022. Last week, uh, Commissioner Messer asked a question, so if you allow me to share that screen to answer that question, Commissioner. Oh, I got my own answer to that question, but you've got one too, great. Yeah. So, um, you asked the question, what, uh, as the, what is it the, uh, the school district is doing related to the, uh, this uh, House Bill, Senate uh, House Bill 1216, which requires to capture data to resource officers. Uh, the uh, the uh, school district, in this case, North Pearson, is required to hold and maintain the data. And the way how they're going to go about, they are required for the sheriff's office to fill this form. And, and they are uh, how they require the data. This form includes the officer's name, the date, the incident type, at that level, uh, primary location, secondary location, how they was the SRO, who was involved, affiliation. So there's a lot of information the school district is going to be gathering at this point. We reach out to the uh, North Pearson School District. They're in the process of building that information. They don't have quite there all that data. Uh, although they provided a model, they perhaps they'd like to go with the uh, Spokane uh, School District. Uh, and that will be the model they are trying to shoot for. But at this point, my understanding is they don't have a robust data set in which they can provide that. So I, let me let me just uh, share what I learned because I and this is nice and complimentary because you went local and I went to the uh, office superintendent of public construction kind of statewide. How is this being handled? And what we learned because uh, I was like, did I miss? You know, this is 2019 law. Did I miss like some report or something? And no, I didn't. Um, this was a 2019 law. They were building these systems. Uh, COVID disrupted uh, kind of what they were doing. They're back. Uh, actually, the, the legislature added some new requirements this past session. So they're, they're um, kind of creating the data collection um, uh, mechanisms. They expect to have initial data available at the end of the 2021-2022 school year. Um, in turn, and they're going to have they're working on a system for a public facing dashboard and all the stuff that can be looked at. So, you know, I feel you know, this is something Commissioner Mejia last year when we and this has nothing to do with the sheriff's office. They're they're just you know a contractual party, but it's really about the school districts and what what their vision is for school resource officers because they're controversial and they've not done they've not been a positive force in some places of the country. I don't think that's true here. I spent the time to talk to the lady, to the superintendents last year. Of Rainier and Rochester, which were the two contracts at issue, I was assured of how they were using their school resource officers. They really wanted to keep them, um, and the state had taken this this initiative to look, sort of take a look at it statewide. So I was com comfortable with that. I just wanted when this when this North Thurston contract came up, I just wanted to check in as a board to say, do we know anything now that we didn't know then? And I think the answer is kind of no. But we'll keep our eyes on this and we'll continue to look at it when we get this data and there may be a conversation to be had in the future, but um, I just wanted to share that with the board. Okay. That's where we're at. And I believe uh, Under Sheriff Brady is here to answer any questions. Anything you wanted to add, Under Sheriff? Uh, no, not specifically. I just wanted to say we have a really good working relationship with the North Thurston School District um, and uh, the Lacey Police Department um, to work collaborative collaboratively on on this program um, we meet uh, once a month um, to go over things and um, you know we really owe it to our community and especially our children to make sure that we get these programs right so we're committed to that I've only ever heard they really appreciate your efforts so thank you Commissioner, no sir okay we're good to go thank you that's 9a we'll go to 10a Superior Court 
Amendment to Drug Court Treatment Services Contract with Pierce County Alliance. Thank you, Commissioner. This particular contract with the uh, Pierce County um, <coughs> uh, Alliance is to provide uh, substance use services uh, to uh, Thurston County DUI Drug Court Program. This current contract starts on June 2021. This Superior Court is asking for extension for one month. We'll add in the description that you requested that last month. That's the extension is for one month. Um, and that will allow uh, Superior Court to go through a formal bidding process. They can secure the services for the next year. You're this, going to add one month? Then? Yes, I, I, I will add this afternoon. So we we'll to approve one in one month contract amendment. Questions, Commissioner? Nope. No questions. Good afternoon. All right. 11 is our scanning items. At 3 o'clock, we'll have a public hearing regarding public works and the development agreement with Poppin Holding. I believe this is to Brandon Town. That's a that's committed to a, a public private partnership. <clears throat> and, and this is to build infrastructure. In this case, it will be a right about at the intersection of Highway 12 with Sergeant Road. Um, and this is one piece of the larger context, uh, meaning that uh, over a month ago, you also amended the contract with the Chicago Strive. They're also going to be financially contributing uh, to this uh, project. So um, I personally, uh, it's a long time coming, finding we'll get to this point, and we can really build this infrastructure that will benefit not just the citizens of the county, but as well as will allow uh, development to occur in that area. Mm -hmm. No, sure. Okay. No, sir. Uh, board of Health has been canceled, so yes. this needs amendment that needs to be made on the just take that out. Proposed agenda. And that brings us to item five. So it was critical we get through this afternoon's agenda. I'm going to propose that we take uh, maybe seven minutes. Yes, it's sir. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good.
<laughs> All right. Well, welcome back. It's the Thurston County Board of County Commissioners agenda setting work session for Tuesday, June 8th, 2021. We are Our mid. Not on. Oh, sorry. Did they hear me? No, they didn't no. hear me. Let's can start you, over. Can you start over? Please okay. Uh, welcome back to the Thurston County Board of County Commissioners agenda setting work session for Tuesday, June 8th, 2021. It's 1107. We're picking back up with item four on this morning's agenda, or sorry, item five, which is a review of next week's draft agenda for June 15th board meeting. That meeting would be called to order at 2 p.m. Pledge of Allegiance to be led by Commissioner Mejia. Consideration of the agenda and board meeting minutes. Uh, opportunity for the public to address the board. County managers update. Anything to report at this juncture? I uh, uh, will follow up if any items that need a follow up uh, based on the public hearing, public testimony too. Okay. And let's go to our consent agenda as proposed. It's two tax title properties from the treasurer. Um, Those are, in, they have been uh, on your agenda for the last, I believe, three, four weeks. Um, so as a request of Commissioner Edwards, I provided some feedback related to uh, the contact the commissioner was could have made to the adjacent property owners uh, to make them aware of, uh, of this particular sale. So I have touch base. The first one is item 3A is for uh, private negotiation. They will include a point two three acres. <coughs> and this located in, in Yale. And the, uh, uh, the price overall uh, for this negotiation is expected to be $1,763, which includes all the fees. And item 3B is, uh, is also, this is a property located in New Coda. And this is a 0.17 acres. And their proposed uh, private negotiation value will be $1,863.50. Um, and then you have uh, several conversations with those two items. So um, oh, yeah, what, like to I see the county treasurer is on. Uh, I don't have any questions. Commissioner Mejia? I don't either. I don't either. I don't either. Let's move on. All right. <laughs> I'd like to compliment the county treasurer for doing the best he can do to uh, get these things back on the cash list. Good morning, Jeff. I'm sorry, I'm here if you had questions. I had to step out for a minute. Looks like we're good to go on these items. Thank you for your, for your work. Okay, thank you. But for next week, Jeff, not, not this afternoon. Yep. Okay. Uh, the financial services voucher list will be reviewed. Uh, I assume there's no questions at this juncture. And we'll add the dollar amount for next week. Right, okay. And that's blank at this point. Okay, then item, department items 4A, central services, resolution and call for sealed beds for Thurston County Correction Facility, roof slash siding repair. Yeah, uh, over the, uh, since uh, the, the jail was built, uh, they have some issues in uh, certain areas that require frequent maintenance uh, related to leak repairs and, and uh, the roof as well as some of the, uh, some of the siding on the walls. So this particular uh, proposal is to uh, is an attempt to secure beds to have uh, Hopefully, a permanent solution that will repair uh, roof level uh, uh, cladding repairs, as well as uh, uh, precast the ceiling repairs and new waterproof coating on the roof as well, and uh, replace all the stucco, uh, stucco um, uh, parts of the wall. Uh, this particular uh, bid has an estimated cost of three hundred fifty, uh, two hundred fifty thousand, I believe. And that uh, has been included in a couple of facilities plan, and uh, this funding comes from building reserves. And there it is here, I believe, or was rather an uh, uh, additional question is related to this particular. And again, this is for uh, authorized uh, calling for uh, seal bids. When the seal, uh, when the bids are received, will come back with a way to consider awarding the contract to the builder. Who, who is here? I'm happy to think it's available to answer any questions. How, how old is this building that we're having to do this? Excuse me? 
Commissioner? How old is the building? Yeah, how old? What's, what's the deal? Was there a flaw or something happened? Or is this just kind of the course of normal maintenance? This is a normal maintenance pro project. Um, we noticed that there had been some leaking um, in certain areas along the roof. We've done uh, minor temporary fixes until we could get this project set up. Okay. No questions. No questions. <clears throat> I remember having that same question. <laughs> Always bad. Some of these problems in this building and family court too were kind of unexpected um, on the newer buildings. Uh, public health and social services is 5A 2021 housing contracts. Uh, thank you, uh, for your consideration is for you to award several uh, uh, awards and grants. And this is a result of a consolidated request for proposals uh, that it was issued back in February 2021, which included funding sources, uh, um, the consolidated homeless grant, uh, the House Bill 2163. Uh, th those are funds that we know, the House Bill 260, Human Services Fund, uh, the Federal Home Fund, and um, through the process in coordination with the Regional Housing Council, the county received 47 applications for funding. And uh, there was a, a subset of the Regional Housing Council that reviewed the applications, and I believe Commissioner Mejia was part of that that review that resulted on, on, on the proposal before you today, uh, which includes uh, 21 uh, affordable housing and homeless services projects serving low-income households and homeless individuals and families in the county for a total combined cost of $4,901,500. Also include four capital housing projects for uh, the development of affordable and supportive housing units for a total allocation of $1,619,333. Also include six housing uh, basic needs projects for a total of 200,000 and six basic need projects for a total of 272,621 dollars. Um, Tom is here to uh, provide additional detail and answer any questions. Commissioner here. This will be my third time reviewing this. Um, uh, but no, a lot of work went into this. Uh, there were a lot of hard decisions that were taken, um, but I think um, just the hard work and, and the applications that, you know, it took to review them and, and score them. Um, it, it took a lot of time and, and hard work and a thank you to the staff, really, uh, because they carried the brunt of this. Um, there was a group of elected officials that only helped with 15 and I know <laughs> The rest of the staff did the, the rest of the work. So so thank you for, for your guidance, Tom and Keeley, uh, during this. And, um, you know, this was uh, approved as is by the Regional Housing Council. So um, I think, you know, it, it was a good decision. Do you feel good about the recommendations? I do feel good about the Can recommendation. Do we have a or something, Tom? I'll, I'll, I'll give you a copy okay. of all the different allocations. I will just give you the feedback. Um, and yeah, I'll give you a copy it's included on the front three. That would be useful. Mm -hmm. I, I guess the only question that I would have, Tom, is we're doing about $7 million. And how many people are we actually helping towards uplifting their life in what, whatever fashion? I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I know you wouldn't have it down uh, to an exact number, but just for the community out there to know that we're trying to help folks. How many do you think we're helping? Yeah, that's um, off the top of my head. That's a, that's a tough number to give you, but we do have reports out of our homeless management information system um, over the course of a year. You know, we hundreds of people receive kind of rapid rehousing. Um, hundreds of people we are being supported in shelter. Um, the affordable housing will will support um, many families. The, the Lehigh project will be sixty families. So you know, throughout the course of a year. Um, the number of households that this this funding will touch will be, um, you know, probably one to two thousand households will be impacted um, by this funding through okay. shelter or other kind of supportive services that we provide, if if not more. 
Hey, Tom, since uh, Commissioner Edwards mentioned $7 million, can you just give us a perspective? Is that more than usual, less than usual? I seem to remember $8 million or something being kind of, I mean, it, did COVID hurt that number or sales tax was up and it helped that number or how does this compare? Yeah, I would say this was probably one of our largest awards. I think this is the largest number or, or amount of money we have had to award. There was a substantial increase in the past year in the document recording fee. Um, so that 2163 funding, you know, in past years, we've collected in the closer to kind of 2.1, 2.2 million dollars. This year, we're close to collecting $3 million in that document recording fee. Um, with interest rates low, many people refinanced their homes in the past year, and we collect a fee from that. So. I would say our funding this year um, has been larger than in, in past years. Great. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Let's go to uh, the next page. Can you give me just a... Oh, yeah. We have a, an alert on the IT, and since we were discussing this, uh, you have been added to a new folder. That's a spam. Please delete it. We're receiving a lot of emails related to you adding a document, so that's spam. Please do not open it and delete it right away. That was my IT public service. We're giving you a little uh, <laughs> cheat sheet for your cybersecurity training. 5B, Treatment Sales Tax Community Grant Awards. Yeah, the commission is for your consideration. It's a follow-up to the discussion that you had related to the community uh, grants award um, using the uh, treatment sales tax for the period of July 1st, 2021. Um, they will begin in, in uh, July 1st, 2021. Uh, the, uh, the board um, had a, a great set of discussions. Trey Cannon facilitated that discussion, and as a result of your decision making process, you, uh, this action is reflects, I believe, the board's direction, which includes. Uh, awarding $100,000 to the Community Action Council of Lewis and Mason County to support treatment sexual abuse survivors through the Honor uh, Children Justice and Advocacy Center. Also includes a uh, Family Support Center for an award of $89,522,524 uh, to provide case management and support for families and behavioral health needs at the uh, Per Blossom Oasis Shelter. Including also is the Northwest Resources for $30,000 per, per year to develop integrated medical care for individuals with behavioral health needs. In addition, family and education and support services for $50,000 uh, to provide classes and peer support for parents with behavioral health needs. And last but not least is YWCA of Olympia for $46,180 to serve youth with behavioral health needs and his youth council program. And Kerry Hennon is here to add additional perspective to this request. Again, this item is just to formalize this award. We have a couple of briefings going through that. Uh, Commissioner? No, sir. No questions. No questions. We're good, Kerry. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Uh, item six is public works. 6A is an agreement with the County Road Administration Board, or CRAB for funding uh, for the 183rd Avenue Southwest, US 12 to Sergeant Road Southwest. Yeah, this, this particular item is for me to authorize the director to sign an agreement with the County Administration Board to receive $1.1 million for the project you stated, uh, Commissioner Minster. Um, and this is 183rd uh, to uh, widening the uh, narrow lanes that will include shoulders. The total project cost of, the, uh, of this is two million seven hundred forty-five thousand. The County Road Administration Board is contributing two point two million. However, the one point one million that you see on this agreement is for the first biennium. The other one point one million is already uh, set aside from uh, CRAB, and it will be in the upcoming biennium. So, the action for you today is to get into an agreement to receive the first allotment uh, of the $2.2 million. Um, and I believe Teresa Parsons is here to answer any questions. Questions for Teresa? No, sir. No, I mean, I asked him, is this a good deal? We were, we were negotiating and we ended up with a good deal. Uh, actually, it's a, it's a grant application that would go through it um, for when it was grant funding from uh, CRAB. So 
the proposal be before you is is a successful grant application process. Absolutely. So Teresa did well, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. She's flying in space. The final frontier, Teresa. Uh, all right. Anything there, Teresa, on this? Okay. No, I, good program. Excellent. That's a lot of money for the county. Appreciate that. Contract award for Latigo Street and Chehalis Western Trail at Spurgeon Creek Project. So the next two projects uh, set aside. Uh, and it's item, uh, items for free to conserve. Uh, one is for Latigo Street, um, and the other one is for Gate, both uh, cover replacements. The reasons we have all the X's, we have not opened the bits. We're going to be opening the bits today, later on today. Mm -hmm. So we just like to set those items for you to take an action. We already, we've already went through these when we put out the request for bids. Right. Um, I believe they had one bid opening today, Marcus. Okay, Wait, Marcus, you got a, you got a uh, How flash. Do out of the press news update? <laughs> yes. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Marcus Storvik, civil engineer with Thurston County Public Works. So the Latigo bid opening was this morning at 10 a.m. Uh, Gate Road, which Ryan Blazer can talk more about, that's Thursday. So the Latigo bid opening uh, had Quig Bros as the apparent low bid at $1,132,215. Um, we received a total of four bids, and they're the apparent low bidder. So right now we're going through and doing our checklist. Um, to make sure they're they're the uh, a low bid responsive low bid. Can you repeat the name of the bidder? Quig, Bros. They're out of um Aberdeen. Quig, like Q I G G. Yep, Q I Q U I G G. Q U I G G. That's where I'm going. Time family. Aberdeen. Yeah. Okay, great. Any questions for Marcus? So we'll not play uh, that for next week. Yes. And in, in, this is just to, you know, expedite the, since the construction season is up on us, so hopefully we can gain a week by introducing this item, and the details will follow. The same as the next item, and this is uh, the gate road, as we heard, the gate openings will be opening on Thursday, and we'll bring back the results of the bid opening next week with the details of the, of the uh, selected uh, contractor as well as the amount of the bid. Okay, I see Ryan's here. Um, same thing there, but we won't go until Thursday. Okay, thank you. Standing items uh, as typical at the end of that meeting, and that will wrap up June 15th. Bringing us to item six this morning, which is proclamations and awards. Good morning, Amy Davis, clerk of the board. Uh, the proclamation for LGBTQ plus Pride Month is included on the agenda today. Um, and again, we will have a representative or two from Capital City Pride. I don't know if you were here I forgot. In person or by Zoom? I think both. Okay. One will be in person and uh, a few more over Zoom. Okay. Okay. Any questions on the proclamations and awards? No, sir. All right. And we'll move on to advisory boards and commissions. That uh, is item seven. I've included the applications of Mercy and Glenn for the Agriculture Advisory Committee that says they are on hold, so to speak, until after the committee's next regularly scheduled meeting of Thursday, June 17th. So we'll just, They're just delay discussion on this item. Okay. Gotcha. Very good. And that'll bring us right to PIO check-in. Good morning, Commissioners. Megan Porter, Public Information Supervisor. Um, I have nothing that needs to be talked about today. Can wait till next week. We're not horribly far behind yet, so if you want to report, feel free. I don't have anything. Okay. Anything Thank you. for Megan? No, sir. Okay. Thank you, Megan. Legislative update? Oh, no. Nope. And let's go to item 10-1, public testimony. I know you were going to preview Ms. Yeah. Dover. Uh, I have two items for you, and this just to bring to your attention. Uh, you received a uh, letter from a citizen. Uh, uh, bringing a, uh, uh, allegations against the county manager related to the veterans fund audit. Um, and so those allegations have been, I, uh, been forwarded to the prosecuting attorney. Um, I will schedule an executive session uh, next Tuesday where I will excuse myself from that executive session where you have the opportunity to discuss the matter with uh, our unit president. And I believe John also is going to be joining us next week. Is that correct, um, Elizabeth? John, 
John, the county prosecutor? Yeah. Okay. Anyways, so that's, I just want to make you aware of that. Um, also, um, I'd like to respond to this afternoon to Ms. Billworth's um, um, uh, statements that have made in a couple of occasions. This related to her, her property. And uh, paraphrasing what her comments was that the zoning has changed after the change hands. So uh, I don't know if this response has been vetted by the prosecuting attorney, considering there, there is a, a claim against the county, but I think it's, it's worth just addressing the, the issue. So all research indicates that the zoning of the parcel in question has been residential for a long time, going back to at least 1983. Has been what? Residential. And has not changed. The scanned documents that Ms. Dilworth provided appears to be a document generated by the Sigma SQL system, which is a system used by the assessor's office. This information is related to tax, tax assessment and tax use code designation, not zoning. And that's how the assessor goes. And that is the documentation that Ms. Dilworth uh, provided. Do we have a copy of that in here, any chance? I can give you a copy of this. No, it was provided okay. to you. Yeah, I'll give you just one. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. So it is presumed that the designation of commercial uh, was assigned by the assessor's office related to the former use of the building, which is the, it was in the property of the fire station. And this perception will be that the property changed hands and the use of the building was no longer a fire station. So uh, as a result, you know, that use didn't carry with the new property owner. The use moved on as the, uh, as the, uh, uh, the owners changed hands. So um, in August 2018, uh, I believe the assessors created a new note, the change in uh, the use for tax purposes, and I believe that's how, uh, how perhaps uh, Ms. Dilworth is saying. The assessor is, is, is seeing the use in order to assess the taxation uh, but that use doesn't uh, move forward with the properties with the property owner. Since the, the uh, ownership changed hands, uh, it goes back to the same zoning. So zoning and use is different. And, and I believe that's how they, perhaps the they, um, confusion may occur. I have a question. Uh -huh. <clears throat> okay, so apparently, it was all residential in that area. But there was a variance given to create this one parcel as commercial when the fire department went in. Right? Uh, that's my understanding. And does the fire department pay taxes? Uh, I mean, I'm just wondering, you're saying for tax purposes, was changed. I didn't know the fire department paid taxes. If it was on a specific commercial use, they pay on that. But if they, well, and even if they didn't, when if somebody else took it over, then the assessor would have to make some kind of well, adjustment. Well, I guess that's my question. Do we have an ordinance or some legislative ability to change something? without going through the normal process. I guess that's what I'm wondering. I don't know when it was residential and when it was changed to So uh, to clarify, the, the zoning has not changed. Well, but, but the property they was use, designated they, as. No, they yeah, use, right? they use. Like a special use permit. Right? Yeah. Is there special special use, was there a special use I, permit? I, I would assume that is the case, the, the fire department is. So the special use permit in this case doesn't carry with the property owner. Or it doesn't even doesn't, carry, it doesn't even carry with any other activity. I mean, there. I, what I've learned, and I'm not a legal expert in this area, but those conditions and those permits are, are tightly constricted. I mean, if you change one aspect of what you're doing here, you can be out of compliance with that conditions of your special use permit. So the idea that I would sell you, I'm doing a fire station and I would sell you if I sold it to you and you wanted to continue a fire station, maybe that works. I don't know, but but it, but if you change in, in some other kind of business, that's not going to work. So the, the 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 bottom line of the research is the zoning residential zoning has not changed. How, okay. And, and I believe that was your argument. 
How long has the fire department been on that location? They're no longer. I know how long had they been there. I mean, well, they moved, at they moved sometime in, recently. Yeah, but I mean, had they been there since 1962, for an example? I, I don't know the answer. Well, to that. Well, All I'm saying well, is. Well, I don't know the answer to that. Just raise uh, the question. If, if they had been there and there were no zoning issues prior to them establishing there, because I mean, I can think of fire stations that I know of that have been there many, many, many years before there was probably any zoning issues. So now, if we've got a commercial activity going on on the property, and it just was grandfathered into the accepted norm of government, is there some problem with once that property sells, it automatically immediately goes back? Or is there a certain expectation that it would continue at its uh, normal use? I don't know. I mean, I would think we would need to have some legislation, the Growth Management Act, county codes, or something like that, that would possibly address that. I, I can't imagine we just get uh, the ability to see, uh, maybe we've got any, somebody coming in that can tell us something. <laughs> well, uh, the thing is, I, I don't work up my line on this commission. So you, you, uh, and that was my concern that I raised last week. We have a pending claim on this, and this has been vetted. The response, so I read it verbatim. Stick to the response. Uh, well, okay, I, 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 okay, okay, good now. So we can the, ask the, these the, questions. So the bottom line is the residential zoning has not changed. And I mean, I, I just, you know, being respectful of citizens, they don't always know the terminology. And so that's why, you know, Ms. Dilworth talks about zoning changes that raises all of our eyebrows. Right, yep. but we know, but we're like we're quasi experts. We know what a zoning change means. She may not understand that, but I just want, that's why I was hopeful that the county manager, with legal blessing, could at least clarify that it's not exact. It's not a zoning change that happened um, because that would be concerning. Now maybe there's something else that happened that's concerning that Commissioner okay. Edwards getting at. Okay. But I just want to clear. I just want it to be crystal clear because it's a, just a factual matter that the zoning did not change. Yeah. The zoning has not changed, and, and there is no way that administratively zoning can change. It's only legislative action. And Josh and I have talked about this. Ms. Dilworth has been raising similar concerns for a couple of years now, and Josh and I talked, it was probably been a year more ago that I was first asking you, what's going on with this? And, you know, I know you made it clear at that point that it was not a zoning change that ever happened. It was related to the uses by the prior owner. Yes, thank you. Joshua Cummings, is it on? No, yeah, it's working. Green light? Yeah, it's got to be a darker green. There you go. Okay, darker green. Joshua Cummings, Director of Community Planning and Economic Development. The county manager has got it right on. This is not a zoning issue. This is about the use of the building. So if you, I know all of us have been on the assessor's site from time to time looking at different values. You have the land value and the building property, the building value, tax use, from commercial to residential is what that paper shows is an assessor determination, not a zoning determination. Our perception in CPED as we've kind of really dug into this, because we knew it wasn't a zoning issue, but we couldn't figure out the confusion from the citizen. Our perception is that she may have seen that change that was made in the use of the building. It wasn't assigned to the parcel, it's about the building. And so that we believe is where some of the confusion is coming in from Ms. Dilworth. We have reviewed this with legal counsel, legal counsel, has approved the statement that has been provided to the county manager, and that's as far as we can go. It becomes a, an issue of perception. All we know for a fact is that we did not, the county, change the zoning at any time since at least 1983. It's been residential the entire time. We cannot speak to the assessor's change of the use on the building from commercial to residential, but we believe that it was because the fire station was no longer a fire station. That building was that building taken down? I can't remember. The building still exists, but it's about the use. Oh, it's being used as now? That's what they're working towards trying to figure out, okay. the, the owners. I, I do have a question. Yeah. Would you know, Josh, when 
the fire department moved out of that property? I don't know. It's when the time of, there you go. Thank 2019? you. 2019? 18? 18. So 2018. Do you know when the, the fire department started using that building as a fire department? You know, we haven't dug much further down into this. This is not necessarily an application. We could do more research if directed by the Board of County Commissioners. Or, or no, don't, don't do it on my mail. I guess what I'm concerned about is if, if in 1950, that fire department went in there and has been recognized as a commercial activity, I guess I don't know that, but uh, somebody's going to be getting jammed up somewhere along the line. I just wonder, won't be the county. If uh, if a use was allowed and there was no ordinances that said if the use changes, then it goes reverts back or whatever, because it sounds like it was all done prior to any of the ordinances that we're dealing with in today's normal course of activities. That's what I'm trying to figure out is if there was an expectation that that would keep going or do we have an ordinance on the books? or a state law on the books or growth management rules on the books that say uh, uh, a grandfathering clause does not continue once an entity uh, change, a property changes hands or something. I just don't know. I'm not trying to figure out the legal case, but I'd say I'm, I'd be darn nervous if, if I had told somebody they couldn't do something when they maybe had been told they could, that's all. So. That's all. I guess I, we can't go into it much deeper than that without maybe some kind of exposure issue or something. So. I think that what Ramirez is saying is that the limit, what we know is it's not a zoning change, and that's all he's we did, that's that's all We he's did doing not do something other than interpretation uh, of what we're going to apply, the county is going to apply uh, those zoning issues that are current, even though they weren't there when that was first put in. So, sounds like the assessor. No, incorrect. The zoning has always been residential. Well, the use of the building. That, that, yeah. The fundamental difference is zoning versus use. Well, so the zoning has not changed since 1983. And that is going to be my response this afternoon because Ms. Dilworth made a couple of statements that the zoning has changed which he hasn't. It sounds like the assessor is like a set assessment of use of the, of the building structure on land is kind of an independent layer. Yeah, I mean, whatever the underlying zoning scheme that sits on the parcels. And this is to the point of flexibility for properties. This is why we have this special use permit process and the reasonable use exception. So the underlying zoning doesn't change, but you go through our process that goes through the hearings examiner that says, I'd like to do this on my property and you're granted that special use permit. That's as part of flexibility or not, or not right? But Ms. Dilworth is not uh, operating a fire department. Oh. Right. And that's when, when, when the property and the, and, the, and the user ceases to be used as such permitted, then- She had the latitude to apply for a special use permit for her own proposed activity. Yes. I think she's in the process of the answer, is that correct? Uh, unclear at this time. Okay. Thank you. Because that costs more money. Everything costs money. Okay. Thank you, John. Okay. Thank you. It was kind of fun to come over here in person. <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. All right. Is that, oh, then you have something else from here? Is that it? Nope. Those are the two items. Okay. Can we move to our executive session? Yes. Please. It is 1141. Should 20 minutes cover it? Uh, you may want to take it to 1215. Okay. We're going to propose then. Uh, that's We're going to move to item 10, subsection 3, an executive session pursuant to RCW 4230-1101-I to discuss with legal counsel representing the agency matters relating to agency enforcement actions or to discuss with legal counsel representing the agency litigation or potential litigation. Specifically, PDC regulations, legal opinions, and board meeting minutes. Okay, yeah, we got multiple things then. Uh, that makes sense. So we've got, we're going to go for 35 minutes. Commissioner's action may follow, and we'll come out roughly 12:17.